Hey everybody, hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, Scott and Keith are here and we will be starting in about five minutes. We have uh, everybody muted. Um, I know there's a significant number of people watching on YouTube. Um, there is a little bit of a delay uh, between YouTube and, and this. Um, just making sure everybody uh, can hear me. I guess uh, you won't be able to, uh, you know, please chat me. There's a chat ability here. Um, if you look at uh, where it says more, there's an ability to chat. If you have questions, please feel free to chat. Uh, if not, uh, we have a time at the end uh, for people to chat so um, and ask questions. So please feel free uh, to come up with those questions.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Scott Sternberg and Keith Nackery here, um, coming to you live from our very empty office with a socially distant and appropriate distance between uh, Keith and I as we, uh, Keith and me, I guess, right? And um, as we prepare this webinar, uh, we are recording this, so if you can't attend or you have co coworkers who can't attend, um, you know, please feel free to uh, let them know that it'll be on our website shortly. Um, we have everybody muted, um, but if you have a question, uh, you can certainly uh, uh, chat it to me. Uh, you can email it to me by simply replying to the invite, um, or you can uh, you can just uh, uh, speak up at the end of the presentation so that way we can hear you. Um, we also have 75 individuals uh, watching us on YouTube already, which is great. I assume that'll uh, significantly increase and uh, almost that many on the Zoom conference. Um, again, uh, my name is Scott Sternberg. I'm a partner here at Sternberg, Nackery & White, and my partner Keith Nackery is here with me, and he has spent the entire weekend um, and much of last week on the CARES Act, which is I'll say probably the most important piece of legislation to pass um, the United States Congress in at least a decade, probably several decades. Um, so uh, Keith, I'll let you go ahead and, and take it away. Sure. All right. There you go, Keith. Okay. Thanks for everybody for uh, taking time out this afternoon to go through the uh, various components of the CARES Act. It's extremely complex and complicate, complicated legislation, um, but vitally important and can have great benefits. There are three main points we're gonna go through during this presentation. Uh, about half of the presentation is gonna concern the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, these are going to be the potentially forgivable loans that are available uh, to businesses. Next, we're going to go through some of the points uh, concerning unemployment and unemployment insurance. And we're also going to cover uh, some of the tax credits available and some other tax effects of this bill. Okay. So like I said, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, for business owners is one of the most important areas of this act um, allows for certain loans to be made uh, via 7a lender so most of the banks you'll have a banking relationship with will uh, offer these um, and a portion of it will be forgivable depending on uh, what the proceeds are spent on we'll go into that in some depth Okay, so what expenses are covered? Um, the loans can be made to cover certain expenses um, from the covered period, which is February 15th through June 30th of 2020. Some of the eligible expenses that can be covered include payroll, rent, debt interest, mortgage interest, and utilities. Payroll has a very broad definition under the act. Um, it can include uh, salaries, wage commissions, or similar compensation, cash tips and equivalents, uh, payments for vacation, parental leave, family medical leave, or sick leave, severance, group health benefits, retirement benefits, some of the state and local taxes that are assessed on the compensation to employees, as well as uh, payments to sole proprietors or independent contractors. That's a huge expansion uh, under the definition of uh, payroll. The payments to independent contractors similar to your employees can be wage commission or net earnings for a self-employed individual. The biggest limitation on these is it can't be for somebody 
who's making $100,000 a year when you prorate the covered period. Payroll does not include federal taxes, so that's a big contract, contrast from the state taxes. Um, compensation in excess of $100,000 a year when prorated for the covered period. Uh, any employee with principal, principal residence outside of the United States. Uh, sick, sick leave for which a credit is allowed under the Families First Coronavirus Act. We'll go through that act in a little more depth a little later in the presentation. Basically, they're not going to allow you to double dip. You can't use the uh, you can't use this part of the act to uh, cover the sick leave and then also claim a tax credit to cover the sick leave. And then uh, qualified family leave again under the Families First uh, Coronavirus Act. This is very similar principle to the sick leave. And again, we'll go into what that uh, sick leave and qualified family leave is in a little more detail uh, a little later in the presentation. So the uh, Paycheck Protection Program loan limitations uh, are as follows. They'll look at the average payroll for the prior uh, year and its average monthly payroll for the prior year. Um, unless it's seasonal, then we do have uh, a couple other ways we can look at that. And they'll multiply it by two and a half times. Um, this amount can go up to $10 million, and it's the lesser of the two. Um, that limitation is, is a significant difference between the economic injury uh, disaster loans that are available through the SBA as well. Um, those loans don't have the forgiveness component that these uh, PPP loans do. Though. So who qualifies? Um, in general, it's going to be businesses with less than 500 employees or an SBA set standard for the industry. Um, some industries will go as high as 1,000 or 1,500. Very important to uh, look at your industry specifically. Um, and this can be done by using the NAICS code uh, for your company. If your NAICS code begins with uh, 72, which is generally going to be hospitality related, um, they'll look at each location for your entity as a separate entity um, when counting the employees. So you may have an entity with 300 employees at one location and 400 employees at the other. Uh, both locations would qualify independent of each other. Um, for purposes of counting employees, we're going to look at both full-time, part-time, or other basis um, when determining those number of employees. We're expecting some regulations to come out to uh, a little more clearly define the other basis part. Um, sole proprietors, independent contractors, and self-employed individuals uh, are also eligible this does not have to be uh, through uh, LLC or uh, incorporation. Other qualifications. So you have to have been in business uh, prior to or on February 15, 2020. This waives the general SBA requirement of being in business for one year. And you have to either have had employees which were paying salaries and paying payroll taxes on or independent contractors that you were uh, paying 1099 wages to. Again, important distinction here um, for the qualification. You may have an entity that has no employees that's still gonna qualify for this. Uh, in the definition of uh, payroll, we're gonna include those independent contractor stipends as long as they're under $100,000 when prorated for the year. Uh, and that can be a basis for both obtaining a PPP loan and the forgiveness. Okay. So learn to, loan terms. Payments are deferred for at least six months and up to a year. Um, the fee and collateral requirements are waived as well. Additionally, there's uh, no personal obligations. So these are non-recourse loans. Um, the company itself is responsible for the loans, but 
there's not going to be the personal guarantee behind them. There's also no prepayment uh, penalties on these loans. And one very large difference between these and most SBA loans is there is no need to show that uh, other credit is uh, not available to you. In the past, uh, these SBA loans are traditionally only available to those who have no other means of obtaining credit. Uh, these loans are also on a very low interest rate, 3.75% um, for for-profit businesses, 2.75% for nonprofit businesses. In addition, any portion of the loan that is not uh, forgiven will be amortized over up to 10 years. Borrowers can work, as we were talking about earlier, directly with qualified 7A lenders. Uh, most of your banks are gonna fall into this uh, category. It is different from an EIDL loan which is an economic injury disaster loan. Um, you can apply for both currently, though that window is closing, but you cannot necessarily obtain both. Um, for businesses that are too large for SBAs, there is a similar program uh, directly through the treasury. And again, qualified 7A lenders can elect to participate in this program. So most of these loans will be able to be obtained uh, through your general banking relations. Um, and again, similar to the, uh, similar to the SBA components, treasury loans are also uh, gonna be uh, some forgivable and uh, also non-recourse. One other important thing that made it into the bill uh, when considering these loans is that the loan themselves are not going to uh, count as a direct benefit and aren't going to disqualify you from other benefits that are part of the CARES Act. Uh, we often have to worry about duplication of benefit, and they made it explicitly clear that these loans would not count as a duplication of benefit. Okay. So loan forgiveness. This is the biggest component of these PPP loans and the most advantageous for businesses. The amount that's going to be forgiven is the amount paid in the first eight weeks um, after receipt of the loan proceeds to cover payroll, mortgage interest, uh, rent and rent obligations. In addition, we're also going to be looking for uh, utility payments. For the mortgage and rent obligation, you have to have entered either the lease or the mortgage prior to February 15th of 2020. Uh, you can't go sign up tomorrow for a new lease and expect those uh, payments to be forgiven. It is subject to some very complicated calculations for uh, two types of reductions. We have both the workforce reduction rule. We also have our uh, salary reduction rules. We'll go into those a little more in depth. So our workforce reduction calculation, we're going to be looking at your potential forgivable amount. We're going to multiply it by the average number of full-time equivalent employees per month during the covered period. And again, that covered period is February 15th through uh, June 30th. We're going to divide that by the average number of full-time equivalent employees per month um, for February, 2015, February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. So we're doing a comparison of the same period from 2020 to 2019. And basically there's a penalty for a reduction in the workforce. Um, the point of the forgiveness is to try to encourage businesses to hold on to their employees for as long as possible during these difficult times. Um, so this is one way to guarantee that that's happening. Um, there is another calculation uh, that can be done for newer companies um, where we'll look at the full-time equivalents during January 1st through February 29th of 2020 as uh, the denominator in that equation. We'll also, for seasonal employers, look back to February 15th through uh, June 30th.
for a salary reduction, not only do you have to maintain your employees, but they want to make sure you're maintaining them at uh, their standard level. So we'll look on a per employee basis and see uh, during the covered period, was there a reduction of greater than 25% of the total salary um, for each employee? Whatever that reduction is, uh, in excess of 25% will reduce the uh, amount that can be remitted. Both reductions are gonna be limited to employees uh, that have not received wages or salary in excess of $100,000 when annualized for any given pay period. Um, one thing to be very careful of is bonuses during this time that could potentially push somebody um, over $100,000 if you annualize the pay periods, right? So depending on how often you pay, we could be multiplying that number by a fairly substantial number. Documentation is required. They're gonna look at, want to look at your payroll tax uh, filings for the prior year. They're also gonna to wanna to look for canceled checks. They're gonna to wanna to look uh, for potential leases, utility bills, Anything you're requesting, you're going to have to substantiate. After the uh, package is submitted, a decision is made within 60 days uh, whether the forgiveness is going to be uh, granted or to what extent it's going to be granted. Um, the loan forgiveness is uh, administered by the actual lender, not the SBA. Um, so working with somebody you have a good relationship with is important. Um, the forgiveness, unlike most debt forgiveness, is a non-taxable event. It's another big thing. We don't wanna have $100,000 in uh, loan forgiveness, only to be hit with $100,000 in income taxes. That's different than normal, right? Correct, that's very different than normal. In general, when you have uh, any type of debt forgiven, it's recognized as ordinary income as if you made that money. So that's a very big bonus. I wanted to go into the, uh, the uh, 6201. This is where we had requirements for uh, certain sick leave as well as uh, certain family leave. So under this bill, the employees must have been employed for 30 days. It applies for employers with fewer than 500 employees. Granted leave to care for a son or daughter under the age of 18. If the school was, uh, or daycare was closed due to the public health emergency and the employee is unable to telework. Um, just because the employee is gonna be home taking care of their children if teleworking is available, um, they can be required to do so. If the leave is necessary, the first two weeks are unpaid, and you'll see in the next section why that is. But the following 10 could be required to be paid, um, up to two thirds of their regular pay, um, up to $200 a day, and not to exceed an aggregate of $10,000. There is a credit we'll discuss that we were saying would be excluded from the PPP loans. Uh, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. Similarly, there's a requirement uh, for paid sick leave for an employee who's unable to work. Either if it's subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine, they're being advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine, or they've experienced symptoms of COVID-19 and are seeking a medical diagnosis. So if you have somebody that's tested for the virus and are awaiting their results, they would qualify under this third bullet. It can also be for someone caring for an individual as a result of the first two issues, or caring for a son or daughter if the school is, uh, or daycare is closed, as we talked about in the prior slide, or they're experiencing any other similar condition um, they are going to be entitled uh, to sick leave for two weeks. If it's one of the first three reasons, it cannot exceed $511 a day 
in five thousand one hundred and ten dollars, which for ten work days um, you get to that aggregate. For the final three reasons, which include staying home uh, with a child, again we're back to two thirds of the pay rate. Uh, not to exceed two hundred dollars a day in a two thousand dollar aggregate. So again, if someone's staying home with their child. If you add the two components together, there will be 12 weeks of pay at 200, not to exceed $200 a day and not to exceed $12,000 uh, in aggregate, but that's where the, uh, the first two weeks is coming from. There is a fully refundable tax credit to cover both qualified and the qualified sick leave and qualified family leave. Uh, similar credits are also available to self-employed individuals who don't quite meet the definitions under this uh, act. Um, and this is where you can't double dip with the PPP loans uh, when requesting forgiveness. Okay. So the U.S. Treasury Management Authority um, has a portion in the act that is nearly identical to the PPP loans, including the forgiveness. These are for businesses that are gonna to be too large for SBA loans. So they're gonna have an excess of 500 employees or potentially greater depending on uh, the industry, if the industry has a specific number that is higher than 500. Regarding entrepreneurial development, uh, grants have been provided to small business development centers and women's business centers um, for training, education, and advising uh, for individuals whose businesses have been affected or have been closed by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, these can be very powerful tools. Training and education can include both uh, basic business concepts, but also uh, concepts specific to the COVID-19 virus and uh, the economy as it's moving. Uh, same for the advising role. EIDL. So with the economic injury disaster loans, there are certain grants that uh, go outside of the traditional SBA loans. Again, we're talking about the waiver of the requirement that uh, you can't find credit elsewhere. We also have a waiver of personal guarantees on amounts under $200,000. Uh, there is a waiver of the one year in business requirement and quick advances within uh, three days of application for amounts up to $10,000 for individuals who are applying for these. If you currently already have an EIDL loan, and would like to take advantage of the PPP loan, the loan can be converted and refinanced into a PPP loan, um, though you may not hold both. The EIDL uh, loans, we did a seminar on last week, and that seminar is available on our website. Um, there are some other differences in the EIDL that may make that the better route for you, uh, but forgiveness is not one of them. Um, they do have longer amortizations up to uh, up to uh, 30 years and uh, can go into amounts up to $2 million. These amounts are not subject to the two and a half times uh, monthly payroll requirement. Okay. So now we'll go into some unemployment benefits. Um, it created the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Fund. It's available through the end of the year um, and provides for those that are traditionally ineligible for uh, unemployment benefits um, and relief when they're not able to work as a result of the coronavirus. These people include self-employed individuals, independent contractors, people with limited work history, um, and others. It increases the unemployment benefit in all of the states by $600 per week, which is substantial. Um, in most of the states, uh, the unemployment max benefit is just under $300 a week. 
so it's a substantial increase. Um, and you can receive it for both traditional unemployment, pandemic unemployment, and the additional $600 is good for four months um, during the time period between February, or between the passage of the bill and the end of the year. There's also been a waiver of the first week waiting period for unemployed and unemployment benefits. Um, and again, that waiver is good through the end of the year. Uh, it also provides funding to states to quickly rehire staff to increase the amount of staffing they have at their unemployment offices. The amount of claims for unemployment over the last two weeks have gone up uh, significantly. So the unemployment benefits uh, at the state level have also been extended to allow for an additional 13 weeks through the end of the year. Um, and for states that participate in reduction in hours unemployment, where somebody is employed, but have been, their hours have been reduced substantially, the states that have those programs are now being 100% federally funded. States that are looking to begin such a program uh, are being 50% funded. Uh, today, that will uh, not be available here. Keep in mind, too, all of the uh, benefits are based on proration. Okay. So now we'll jump into the individual rebates. These are the checks that everybody's heard about that are uh, being issued directly to individuals. Um, it's a $1,200 check per individual, $2,400 for uh, couples, and an additional $500 for all dependents. Um, these checks are subject to certain limitations and reductions, subject to a $75,000 AGI uh, limitation. So if your adjusted gross income on uh, your 2018 or 2019, if you filed it already, tax return is less than $75,000, you'll receive the full amount. For married couples uh, that are filing jointly, that amount goes up to $150,000. Um, you also cannot be a dependent of someone else and are not claimed as a dependent by someone else. And you have to have a valid social security number. For amounts, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back to that point. For those that are on, uh, that have no taxable income, such as social security recipients, um, they are still eligible for this individual rebate. And for every uh, $100 above the AGI limitations or $200 for married couples, the amount is reduced by uh, $5. So uh, we had a question that I think would be, what about independent contractors versus employees as it relates to these unemployment benefits? Yeah, so uh, there is an expansion that we'll get into. Um, but it does include both uh, both independent contractors and self-employed individuals. That was, and actually we already went through that, that was uh, part of the expansion into people that are not uh, generally covered. And, what, and why is it only 50% in Louisiana? Is that something, and why is it not available in Louisiana? You said that earlier. Yeah, so we don't currently have a reduction in uh, employment benefits program, a, a reduction in time program in Louisiana is fully set up. Um, so if the state would set one up, the federal government would fund 50% of it, the remainder would have to be funded by the state. We've had a question that I think is really interesting about this unemployment. It may be better for the actual employee to get laid off and collect unemployment under this bill then stay on your payroll, right? So in some ways it could, but keep in mind if you're intending to, one, if you're intending to stay in business, you may need the employee. But two, if you're intending to apply for the uh, pay tech 
Paychecks Protection Payroll uh, Program and have the uh, forgiveness of the loan. The employees need to stay on so you have the expense. And in addition, if you reduce your workforce, you'll have a reduction in what will be forgiven uh, on a pro rata percentage. So it can be very harmful to take that approach with some employees and not all. One way or another, you need to kind of fully be all in. Um, so if you're maintaining production at any level, um, you may be better off applying for the PPP loan um, and the application for forgiveness. The application for forgiveness can be very complicated, but um, it's very doable. Okay, so back to the individual rebates, as I was saying before, that we use your 2018 tax returns as its basis. Um, or 2019 if you filed it. There are uh, documents that can be filled out if there's been a drastic change. Um, good example with this would be if you've had a, uh, a child born recently, um, prior to or after uh, your last tax filing, they wouldn't necessarily know that you have an additional dependent for the $500 additional rebate. Um, and again, as we discussed, for the reduction in the rebate, it's $5 per $100 you're over uh, for individuals and over $75,000 for individuals and $150,000 for married couples filing jointly. Uh, you're completely phased out at $99,000 for individuals, $146,500 for head of household and $198,000 for married couples. So if you have an adjusted gross income, in excess of those amounts, uh, you're out of luck. You will not be receiving a check. Okay. There were some substantial changes to retirement account withdrawals that are could be extremely beneficial. So beginning January 1st of this year, um, individuals have been allowed to withdraw up to $100,000 without penalty. Uh, taxes from the income when such distributions are made, are gonna be paid over uh, the next three years. So the taxes on that, so you won't get hit with the 10% penalty, but in addition, you won't have to pay taxes immediately on the income that you normally would on such distributions. Um, and you may recontribute those funds back in over the next three years without cap. So you can get, if you take 100,000 out, you can get 100,000 back into your retirement account over the next three years um, without doubt. These are the reasons you can make such distributions. Um, you're either diagnosed uh, with COVID-19, you have a spouse or a dependent that has the same diagnosis, or, and this is kind of the catch-all provision, You've had adverse financial consequences as a result of the quarantine. I think most people would. You've been furloughed, laid off, had a reduction in hours, you're unable to work uh, due to lack of childcare, and uh, you have a closing or re a reduction of hours of a business owned and operated by you, uh, all due to the virus. Um, most people will fall into one of those categories. For nonprofits, um, there have been some substantial changes made to allowable donations. Uh, cash contributions up to $300 are, uh, are uh, deductions without even itemizing. For those who are itemizing, uh, the 50% AGI cap uh, has been suspended for 2020. And, uh, Increases in AGI limitations for corporations have gone up to 25%. Um, these are presenting substantial opportunities for nonprofits to seek funding for both individuals and corporations. So Keith, we have a number of nonprofits on the line, I know, because we represent a number of them. You're saying that normally when someone gives a, uh, a gift, to a, a nonprofit like uh, the uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Foundation or the, the Pro Bono Project, the deduction that they get 
is only if they itemize their deductions. Correct. And then it's only 50% of their adjusted gross income at most. So now if somebody were to give $5,000 to the Young Leadership Council, they would get a full $5,000 deduction no matter what their AGI is if they itemize. Correct. The cap is gone. So they're trying to encourage people to donate to churches and nonprofits. Correct. Okay. Because a lot of those churches and nonprofits have had their events, their services, and the things that normally generate that revenue completely cut off because of the self-quarantine issues or the, the stay-at-home orders. Yes, and this was a substantial attempt to uh, assist with raising capital for those organizations. Awesome. Employee retention credit. So this is a, uh, again, another credit that we can't double dip, but is another option for individuals who are not looking to do the PPP route um, or may decide to do an EIDL so they don't have the loan forgiveness available to them, so now they need to go a tax credit route. Um, it's a refundable payroll credit that looks at 50% of wages paid to employees during the uh, during the crisis, which is the covered period, right? So February 15th through the end of the year. Um, it's, and for employees with over 100 employees, we're looking at fully or partially, uh, that have been fully or partially suspended uh, due to the COVID-19 shutdown order or where gross receipts have uh, declined by 50% compared to the previous year, uh, same quarter. Um, or it also is covers employees providing services unrelated to COVID-19, right? So for employers with greater than 100 employees, they put additional restrictions, right? So 50% of the wages paid during the two employees as a refundable payroll tax credit is only available for the employees that are providing services unrelated to COVID-19. So if your business ramped up as a result, so you produce uh, masks, you produce hand sanitizer, something along those lines, if you have over 100 employees, you're not gonna be covered here. Um, or you're only gonna be covered for activities unrelated to COVID-19. This is capped on the first $10,000 paid to each employee and is going to be for the period March 13th through the end of the year. Social Security taxes for employees um, are deferred through the end of the year. This is going to be uh, the 6.2 percent. The payments will be due in two equal payments over the next two years though at 1231-21 and 1231-22. This is to help loosen up cash flow uh, for businesses. This doesn't mean we can go back though and get uh, previously paid and remitted payroll taxes, but it means uh, prospectively and moving forward through the end of the year, uh, the employer portion can be withheld. It is important to note too, this is the employer portion that can be withheld. That, uh, can be deferred. Okay. So modifications for net operating losses. This can be huge for uh, certain companies who experienced really booming years and then uh, had an off year, or just simply had a greatly depreciable asset in a single year. So net operating uh, net operating losses that have been generated in 2018, 2019, or 2020 can now be carried back five years to offset uh, prior income. These returns can be amended. Um, it applies to corporations, pass-through entities, and sole providers. Uh, this is one of the uh, more shadowed areas of the act, but is extremely powerful um, in the tax landscape. And finally, we'll go through a little bit of the student loan relief. Um, it is deferring student loans and suspending interest through September of uh, September 30th of this year. Um, this is without uh, 
without penalty. Um, anyone looking to make sure their student loans are deferred should call the uh, Federal Student Loan Center. This does only apply to federal student loans, not those held by private uh, companies. So in conclusion, this act should serve as a major shot in the arm for businesses to hopefully keep businesses going along um, until we can return to some normalcy. The loan forgiveness program is probably the most significant benefit uh, available. It requires tremendous preparation of the documents. Um, it can be extremely complicated. And it is one of those things that once you've submitted, you can't unring the bell. So uh, tremendously complicated, but tremendous, can be tremendously lucrative for your businesses. Um, professional assistance is likely gonna be needed. And you know, we are happy to uh, assist with anybody uh, needing those services. So Keith, um, we've gotten a few questions already. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of just ask them to you. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and start talking. Um, I think the biggest one had to do with, I've got it a number of times, with respect to the $100,000 cap on payroll. Um, can you explain that and, uh, and kind of explain it again? Because I had a few people ask, sure. can you say that again and, and explain what it means for people who have employees that make more than 100000 or they own their own business and they make more than 100000 sure. So the forgiveness portion uh, of payroll is going to be forgiving uh, for employees who are making under $100,000 when you annualize the compensation. Um, so if you do have a highly compensated individual, let's say you have somebody making $150,000 a year, uh, you will not be able to use that individual's uh, payroll to the extent that it's $150,000 for uh, that eight week period where you're getting those expenses for him. So you do have to be careful with organizations who have many highly compensated individuals, uh, the PPP route may not be the best route for you in that case, because you may not qualify. So like this law firm, for example, right? We have employees that make a little more than $100,000, so we're gonna have to consider that. A lot, of, a lot of professional companies like us are gonna have that problem. Professional service companies are gonna have uh, that problem more than most. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, escape out of this uh, full screen so we can get back to the uh, to the call itself. Um, so, so Keith, what about independent contractors that make more than $100,000? So independent contractors uh, are going to go by pretty much the same rules. Um, for purposes of forgiveness, you can consider an independent contractor essentially an employee, um, so that excess can be a problem. Okay, so it'll, it'll be the same issue no matter what. Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, there was a question about that the Louisiana work site does not currently provide for independent contractors to apply for unemployment. I actually know the answer to this question because we just researched it for a client. Um, it doesn't matter. Apply anyway. Um, you know, the fact that it says independent contractors are not eligible is more a function of the uh, state's um, kind of uh, inability to update its website. Right. State has their hands full right now. They're right. getting more uh, unemployment uh, applications uh, in the last couple of weeks than uh, substantially more. You know, I've seen some numbers that are you know, 40 to 50 times as much as they would normally get in a week. Right. Um, so the state understandably has their hands full on many levels and uh, may not be keeping up. Okay. Um, next question that I had was, um, do you know if forgiveness will be approved within 60 days and how will we know that that actually happens? So the act itself requires that the lenders uh, either approve or deny. So come up with a conclusion to the request for, for uh, forgiveness within 60 days. That being said, 
the better the package is put together um, and the more understandable it is, the better the likelihood that you receive your full amount requested for forgiveness. Um, so having the ability to actually run the calculation yourself and provide the proper supporting documentation will speed up the process. Uh, but in accordance with the act, a conclusion has to be reached within 60 days of the request. Now, if you're missing documentation, have you actually made the request? Probably not. Um, so having a complete package will uh, drastically speed up with the call. Um, we had a question uh, actually just now from somebody who asked about certain banks like Whitney um, or Chase or um, you know Gulf Coast. They don't know how this program is going to be administered as we sit here today, do they? Correct. Uh, regulations are actively coming down uh, to help guide some of these banks, but they are putting together these programs, uh, you know, just as quickly as anybody. This is new ground, and um, the act was literally passed on Friday. So that they're kind of coming up with it on the fly. Correct. They're getting guidance from again the SBA primarily, um, but. If this is an actively evolving area. Um, does a business have to show a loss in order to uh, in order to qualify for the PPP or an SBA loan here? No, business does not have to show a loss. Um, there is a presumption uh, that all those in the affected areas are affected, um, and. A reduction does not necessarily equate to a loss. So uh, most who apply will qualify from, uh, at least from that perspective. Okay. Um, what if an employee transitioned to a new job recently and the company is going to replace that employee, hire somebody new, like say, you know, one of our lawyers here went somewhere else and we hired a new lawyer. Can we still compensate that person under the PPP and get reimbursed for it? Yes, new employees are allowed. Um, though keep in mind, growth is never a bad thing. What they're looking for is reduction. So if you have reduced your workforce recently, regardless of whether it was uh, related to uh, COVID-19 or not, um, it can have a fairly drastic effect on the forgiveness. Because your reduction in workforce, unlike your reduction in payroll, uh, where it's you know dollar for dollar over the 25% reduction, your reduction in workforce is a fraction. Um, so if you had four employees and you now have two employees, your forgiveness may be cut in half. Um, your forgiveness, it's also important to note that your forgiveness cannot be increased by that fraction. So if you had four employees last year and you now have 10, you're not gonna get two and a half times your forgivable amount. It'd be great if you could, but that's not the case. Um, and you'll also have to worry about when calculating that two and a half times payroll, they're gonna look back uh, at the prior year. So you may not qualify for as much as you would currently need to maximize your forgiveness. Interesting. Uh, so the hundred thousand dollar employee rule. A lot of people have questions about that. that does it go up to a hundred thousand dollars? So if somebody makes one hundred and fifty, you can only claim a hundred, or is it if they make more than a hundred, you don't get it? Period. Yeah. No. So certain parts that changes, but in general, um, it's going to be we're only looking at employees under hundred thousand. Okay. So if you're an employee that makes one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. You don't get $100,000. Right, especially for counting how many employees you have that employee will not count. And if we, if we were to furlough some employees, uh, should we now bring them back in order to kind of get the benefit? So you do have the ability to bring employees back um, and not have it count against you for uh, both reduction purposes and for expenses moving forward. Okay. Um, so they are trying to encourage that. That being said, if we kind of switch gears and under our unemployment scenario, those furloughed employees um, are going to fall. How about temporary staffing? Could we bring in temporary staffers? So full-time and part-time employees are included as employees on this. But 
but say your business ramps up, like maybe our law firm business ramps up. Can we bring in a bunch of new lawyers temporarily and pay them under PPP and get a reduction? Yeah, so keep in mind they can still be included as part of your workforce. However, your total PPP loan amount is going to be set uh, by your prior payroll. So you are going to have a natural cap through that. Last week we did a, a seminar on the SBA loans that was very well attended. And for everybody who's watching and wasn't there, it's actually on our website right now at snw.law. You can watch a recording of it. And we don't do SBA loans for people. That's not our job. We're not financial advisors, but it is something that you might need a lawyer's help with on occasion. So we did a, a little webinar. The, a question comes in, can you have a SBA loan and a CARES Act loan? Is there any problem with getting both? So, so yes. Um, both an EIDL loan and a PPP loan are both considered to be SBA loans. Okay. Um, you can currently have an application in for both. The time on that is rapidly closing. Uh, what, you, what you can't have is both loans. So if you currently have an EIDL because you applied for this, uh, you know, weeks ago and were approved, doubtful, but if it were the case, uh, the EIDL loan can be refinanced into the PPP loan, again, subject to the limitations, um, but it is, for the most part, neither or. Uh, okay. Um, oh, interesting question about small businesses that employ spouses. Um, if both spouses are employed, does that affect the $100,000 limit? If one of them makes more and the other one makes less, they file jointly? Yeah, so from an employee level, you're still going to look at each one individually. Right. Um, from a filing level, for purposes of the rebate, you would look at them jointly. Right. Um, and so, we're not, filing, so. so we're not necessarily answering the question because we're not going to give people tax advice, but right, you got to look at it. Each case is going to, some of the details are going to change that, but in general, for PPP purposes, you're going to look at them as two separate employees. Right. Great. Um, let me see if there are any other big questions that I need to answer. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of people with the, uh, Hundred thousand dollar question. I think we got a lot of people. Who yeah, so employees a the, lot. the hundred thousand dollar question is again, it's one of the more intricate areas. So your individual details are going to matter. Um, those are going to be questions that are probably better answered offline. Right. Um, and you know, we're available uh, if you need to reach out to us. Right. Um, well, team, uh, we're we're approaching. Uh, We're approaching, uh, well, uh, one more question. This is a good one. If I get a temporary job to help me while my business is closed, will I be ineligible for a PPP? I think the answer to that is no, right? No, so keep in mind what the purpose of the PPP loans is though, is the purpose of the PPP loan is to try to uh, encourage you to keep those expenses moving and to fund those expenses. And forgive those expenses, but it's only going to forgive those expenses as they're incurred within the first eight weeks of the funding of the loan. So if your business is remaining closed and you're not going to be eligible for any of the amounts to be forgiven, you're likely better looking at the IDL. Um, again, same interest rate, potentially longer term. None of the amount will be forgivable, but if you're not going to spend it on things that are forgivable, that may be the better route to, to go. What about if you got an SBA loan like from the flood in 2016 or even from the hurricane? Did, does this, did that affect your eligibility at all for this? I, no, not directly. Um, but it could if you're like over leveraged, right? I mean, correct. Okay. So you still have to be credit worthy. That's why I'm saying not directly. Um, it's also going to be with your individual lender. A lot of these questions uh, will have to be addressed with the individual banks. Right. And we've had a few people ask if they can um, pay themselves with the through their business, you know, and leave their payroll low in order to stay under that hundred thousand. But I mean, it's really you can't. That would be that would be like 
you know, we think that would probably be wire fraud, something bad. Don't do that. Yeah, not necessarily, but you're dealing with a very intricate plan there, and I would not recommend doing that without direct guidance. Right. You should definitely talk to a lawyer before you do anything uh, with your salaries and, uh, you know, having people take a pay cut, all that stuff. I mean, the last thing you want to do is, is manipulate your your payroll so that you can qualify for a government program. That's when the U.S. Attorney right. gives you a ring. So, right. And we don't do criminal work here, so you have to talk to somebody else about that. Keep in mind, too, when you're looking at, again, qualification for the PPP loans, it's going to be based on your prior payrolls, which are going to exclude your $100,000 and up uh, employees. Right. So the amount you're going to be able to apply for is going to be minimized. Right. And uh, we're preparing as a firm to, to do some work on all these loan forgiveness, right, Keith? Correct. We will be assisting clients with packaging uh, the loan forgiveness requests. We're actively working with banks to make our packages as efficient and as effective as possible um, to help kind of guide you through these complicated calculations and also the potential uh, legal pitfalls that again, there are certain things that can be done that can't be done wrong. Um, so you have to be very careful during the forgiveness application. And, and we've been talking to banks about how to apply and, and how, how to apply for forgiveness, what their uh, forgiveness uh, process is gonna look like. That way we can mirror our applications to that process to speed up, hopefully, well uh, above that 60 day limitation. All right, so um, we're out of time. Uh, we will post a recording of this online. Uh, I have a few other thoughts to share with you. Uh, first, uh, make sure you're uh, appropriately social distancing. Uh, you can see there's uh, six feet between Keith and I, and we will not uh, interact uh, other than this across this table. Um, we're going to do a business interruption seminar for those of you who have business interruption claims. I'll be sending out an email about that. Uh, we're, we're hoping that'll be tomorrow evening. Um, there's a lot of questions about, you know, can we engage you, uh, this firm? Can we help you? Um, yes, we can help you. We can't apply for a loan for you. That's not, our, that's not our job. What we can do is work through the legal problems that we think you're going to have um, when, when getting these uh, programs and engaging in these programs. And so we'd invite you to go to our website, snw.law, or send either one of us an email. Uh, Keith is Keith at snw.law. And that, and that uh, your families are safe and well, and we understand that uh, life is going to be very different for a little bit of time, but our law firm uh, was literally built for this. We are built to work remotely. Uh, Keith and I are the only two people in our office right now, and uh, we're the only two people who are going to be here for quite, uh, quite a long time because everybody has the tools to work from anywhere. And I hope that, uh, I hope that the next time, I'm uh, just getting a message here that the feed froze, so I'm just letting you all know. Once again, if you'd like to learn more about our firm or engage uh, the firm to assist you with any of these business issues during the COVID-19 crisis, please go to snw.law. Uh, that's where all the information is. Uh, we thank you so much for attending this presentation. It will be on our website by the end of the day. Feel free to send it around. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day and is uh, safe and healthy. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Keith.